We're breaking off from our study of Titus to study Psalm 9. So please turn in your Bibles to Psalm 9 and stand for the reading of the Word of God. Psalm 9. I preached a longer version of this psalm in 2008. So if you want to go to sermonaudio.com and get a more complete sermon than just a puny hour sermon, <laughs> uh, you can go there. Let us hear the word of God, Psalm 9. I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart. I will tell of all thy wonders. I will be glad and exult in thee. I will sing praise to thy name, O Most High. When my enemies turn back, they stumble and perish before thee. For thou hast maintained my just cause. Thou dost sit on the judging righteously. Thou hast rebuked the nations. Thou hast destroyed the wicked. Thou hast blotted out their name forever and ever. The enemy has come to an end in perpetual ruins, and thou hast uprooted cities. The very memory of them has perished. But the Lord sits as king forever. He has established his throne for judgment, and he will judge the world in righteousness. He will execute judgment for the peoples with equity. The Lord also will be a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble, and those who know thy name will put their trust in thee. For thou, O Lord, hast not forsaken those who seek thee. Sing praises to the Lord who dwells in Zion. Declare among the peoples his deeds. For he who requires blood remembers them. He does not forget the cry of the afflicted. Be gracious to me, O Lord. Behold my affliction from those who hate me, those who dost lift me up from the thou who dost lift me up from the gates of death, that I may tell of all thy praises, that in the gates of the daughter of Zion I may rejoice in thy salvation. The nations have sunk down in the pit which they have made. In the net which they hid, their own foot, foot, foot has been caught. The Lord has made himself known. He has executed judgment. In the work of his hands, the wicked is snared. Higion Selah. The wicked will turn to hell even all the nations who forget God. For the needy will not always be forgotten, for the hope of the afflicted perish, nor the hope of the afflicted perish forever. Arise, O Lord, do not let man prevail. Let the nations be judged before thee. Put them in fear, O Lord, let the nations know that they are but men. See you You may be seated. Preachers were exhorted by a preacher on Facebook yesterday, urging them not to yield to the temptation of preaching on the subject at hand, everything we're confronting in America, but just preach the simple gospel. <coughs> I know what that guy meant. And the gospel that he wanted me to preach never saved anybody from hell, much less transform a culture. So I'm going to disobey that preaching. I'm going to do both. I'm going to preach on what's happening today, and I'm going to preach that the only hope for what's happening today is the gospel found in the Bible. Now, you noticed I trust the name of my sermon. And if you have been watching the news at all, You've seen in every one of these riots and demonstrations all over America in all these cities, people holding up these signs that say, no justice, no peace. 
That's the title of my sermon today. But I mean the opposite of what they mean. And you've got to understand that words are powerful things. And just because words are said powerfully and emotionally they does not mean they're true. Nor do they mean the same thing that we as Christians mean. Uh, I want to recommend two YouTube lectures for you. Try to listen to them this afternoon. Get your teenage children and everybody else around to listen to and watch these two lectures. One is called Cultural Marxism. And the other is called Defining Social Justice. And they're both made by a longtime friend of mine named Bodie Bauckham. Bodie Bauckham is a black man, grandfather, muscular, martial arts expert, long white beard. And uh, has been a close friend of mine. His daughter was in my daughter's mercy's wedding. And when Mercy introduced her husband to Modi Bauckham, he said to him, welcome to the family, son. And he and I would speak, lecture at conferences together. And one time I preached for about an hour on how you regulate what goes on in worship service, that you can only do in the worship service what God commands in scripture. So after I finished, and Everybody left. I sat down on the front row to rest. And I felt this dark presence behind me. And all of a sudden, this great big black bearded face reached over and gave me a kiss on the cheek. And he said, Pastor Moorcraft, if you were only a Baptist, your theology would be perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so be sure to listen to these uh, excellent lectures. They're articulate, they're clear. Pay attention, get a notepad, take notes, ask your children about them. That's how important they are. Now, what do these people today that are burning down our cities mean by peace and justice? Peace is the removal of the patriarchal hegemony that is the power structure of the United States comprised largely through the years of Europeans who wanted to build on a Christian base. We've got to remove that power structure and cause the various minorities in the United States to experience the redistribution of wealth and power so that the wealth that was unjustly made by these Europeans can be justly given to those that didn't earn it by the forced redistribution of the wealth. Uh, that's what justice is. Peace comes when we remove entirely the Christian base. They speak in terms of capitalism. There wouldn't be any capitalism without Christianity, though I don't like the term. So it, what you see out there is not about racism. When you see people burning businesses of the people of the same race, when you read about hundreds of black babies being aborted every day, black lives don't matter. No lives matter. It's only the exaltation of the various groups and the destruction of the group in power. Karl Marx died in about 1888, and you know all about him. He believed that capitalism, age, the age of capitalism would fall and there'd be a conflict between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, and out of that would come a revolution and the creation of a communist world. What confused his followers is it never came in the West. Never came. So in the early 1800s, some various Italian and German scholars brought up some answers as to why the communist revolution never made it to the West. 
They said it's because of those in power that keep everybody else suppressed. You know, those in power, largely Europeans, more or less wanted to build on a historic Christian base. And all the various other minorities are kept in check. So they invented something called social justice. There's no such thing, by the way. Justice, social justice has nothing to do with justice. Don't even use the word. Don't use the phrase. Social justice is about the forced redistribution of the wealth and power from those who've made the wealth and exercised the power to those that are allegedly oppressed. <clears throat> and much of the narrative of social justice, Black Lives Matter, don't, don't sympathize with them. You're not a racist. Black Lives Matter has an agenda that aims at the destruction of the things you believe. As Christians, not as Europeans, as Christians. Antifa, these are organizations that are committed to the destruction of the last remnants of a Christian nation in this country. And these early Italians said, well, let's do it back in the early part of the century. Let's do it gradually. <clears throat> let's aim, first of all, at the robes. Let's take over the robes. Boy, did they do it. Now, who wears robes in Western culture? Judges. Preachers. Professors. Politicians. Let's go for the robes. Let's control what people are hearing and what preachers say and what uh, 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 teachers say. And let's cause judges to be convinced. And then they said, secondly, we've got to capture the media. We've got to make sure that the news that people listen to in that country continually blasts at them a narrative that is not true. That's contrary to Christianity. And then gradually, we'll have America. Except some people in our lifetime are tired of waiting. And so now they're returning to violence and wickedness. You think you've seen the end of this? The looting. Understand who the looters are. They're anti-Christians. Most of the people in these riots have no idea what they're there for. But the people that call the shots, the people that organize, the people that finance, are using all of these people as pawns to accomplish their purposes. They think they're honoring the black man that was killed by the policeman. Some of them don't know his name. And there's all kinds of reasons they're out there. But they're all being motivated and moved and manipulated to burn down America and to rebuild it. Well, so you see, at the heart of Marxism is there is a struggle in life. You have a situation, you have another situation, there's got to be some way of turning the thesis and the antithesis into a synthesis. And you do that by revolution. Now, I don't want to scare you, but I don't want you to be naive either. But this does not keep me awake because I know God's in control. And so today, I want us to evaluate what's going on in the the light of Psalm 9. Psalm 9 is about peace and justice and righteousness and all those things. And it, help, it will help you to think as a Christian. Now remember, social justice is not justice. It has nothing to do with justice. It has to do with a forced redistribution of wealth and power from the haves to the have-nots. Cultural Marxism, which is behind all this, is that which was created in the early part of the 20th century 
because these people were worried that the revolution hadn't come. Now, there's three words I want to explain that are used in Psalm 9 before we expound Psalm 9. Those are the words afflicted, righteousness, and justice. Several times throughout the Old Testament you have God talking about afflicted, oppressed, poor people that he will take the side of. And out of that, without really considering what the Bible meant, these socialists and communists and social justice warriors say, well, this means that God is for the poor. <clears throat> That God is for poor people everywhere. He's on the side of the poor. He's against the rich, even though some of the greatest men in the Bible were rich, like Abraham and David. But God's for the poor. Whoever you are, poor and oppressed, God's for you. No, he isn't. That's not the teaching of the Word of God. <coughs> The Bible does not say that God is for all poor, afflicted, oppressed people. Whenever in the Old Testament you see the word poor, afflicted, oppressed, in your own mind put before that word H-I-S. God is for His poor people. God is for His oppressed people. God is for His afflicted people. And our text even says who these people are. They are people who trust in him, but who are being abused at the hands of the world. So God is for his poor people who have been mistreated by the wicked people of the world. Don't buy into the Marxist class conflict idea that God is for all poor people. Or for, this God's for all rich people either. Now the other two words are the two great important words of this passage. They are translated in our English text, righteousness and justice or judgment. Let me look at the verses where they occur. Verse 4, For thou hast maintained my just cause, thou dost sit on the throne judging righteously. Verse 8, and he will judge the world. Uh, verse 7, but the Lord sits as king, is what it says in Hebrew. But the Lord sits as king forever. He has established his throne for judgment, and he will judge the world in righteousness. So those two words are brought together often in our text. Look how often they're brought together in the book of Psalms. Turn to Psalm 89. In Psalm 89, it says, verse 14, Righteousness and justice, or judgment, are the foundation of thy throne. And then I'll turn over to Psalm uh, 97, verse 1 and 2. The Lord reigns, let the earth rejoice, let the many islands be glad. Clouds and thick darkness around him, righteousness and justice, or judgment, are the foundation of his throne. So you see those words brought together throughout the Old Testament. They're very important. We're not just making some kind of Ill, Ill, little irrelevant uh, distinction between the two. We're not just talking about semantics. We're talking about two perfections in God that are manifested in the life of man. Righteousness and justice or judgment. And so as to keep them distinct, the rest of our sermon, I'm going to translate the second word in English, judgment. Righteousness and judgment. Now, English versions switch them around. Sometimes they call justice righteousness. Sometimes they call judgment uh, justice. I get it all mixed up. But there are two Greek words, uh, Hebrew words, that are clearly distinguished, though inseparable. Let's talk about the word righteousness. Righteousness is the Hebrew word sedek. S-E-D-E-K. And to say that God is righteous 
is to say that God never acts out of character. You can always trust him. He's always reliable. He's going to never do anything contrary to his holy, morally perfect character. Setic literally means to be in strict accordance with a standard. Now how in the world can that be said about God? Strict accordance to a standard. Because God's not accountable to any standard. There's no standard or law outside of him to which he must submit. There are no moral absolutes outside of him that he must obey. No laws of logic. No laws of morality. That there's nothing outside of God that he is accountable to. But there is a law in the heart of God. And that is his holy, morally perfect character. And he loves that holy character. And he never acts out of accord with that character. He's always consistent to it. He always lives and acts in accordance with it. He's not accountable to you. He's not accountable to me. He's not accountable to any standard or any law outside of him. But he does that love that law in his own heart, which is himself, and his own morally perfect character. Have you ever noticed in the Old Testament, like I think Psalm 19, where it call, God's law is called testimonies? You know, one of the reasons they're called testimonies is because they testify to God's character. The law of God is the transcript of God's holiness and character. You want to know what God's character is like in black and white? Read his law in the Bible. Because his law is a testimony to the law that's in his heart. And there's no higher standard, no higher authority, no higher law anywhere in all of creation than that law that's in the heart of God. That holy character of God by which he judges everything in his creation. And that law in the Bible is a description, a written black and white description of God's character. Just like Jesus is the revelation of God's character in flesh and blood. You want to read what God's like in the Bible? Read his law. You want to see what God is like and how he is holy and righteous? Look at Jesus. Because in Jesus you have the incarnation of his righteousness. So we're dealing with a fundamental issue in the scriptures. No law is just. No governmental policy is just. No parental requirement is just. No policy of the church is just if it's not consistent with the law that's in God's heart. That's written in black and white in the Holy Scriptures. And that's why justice will not be found for America yet until citizens and politicians realize there is no such thing as justice outside of the law of God. That justice is just an empty and arbitrary word. The redistribution of wealth and power from the haves to the have-nots. Oh, it's just about that, nothing. It's impossible for a judge to render a just decision or a politician to make a just law or to deal properly with the various situations and racism that are in our world today justly without the written revelation of the character of God found in God's law. I used to have a bumper sticker that is still true. God's law are, is or chaos. And if you don't think that's true, go turn your television on. So you see how fundamental these things are. God's righteousness means sedek, S-E-D-E-K. He never acts out of character. He always acts in accordance with his own holy, perfect nature. The law that's in his heart. His law in the Bible is a written revelation of that law and that holy character. And Jesus Christ is the incarnation of it. So, 
The Republicans have no answer for what's going on today. The Republicans have no answer to the riots. And the Democrats don't either. Uh, there is a Republican that came closest to it. And he's Lieutenant Governor of Texas. And he said recently in a public press conference, <coughs> our only hope for America is Americans accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Mm -hmm. it took a great amount of courage to say that. But he's moving in the right direction. All right, righteousness, set it. Act in accordance with character and according to the standard in God's heart. And then the other word. I mean, that word for judging is pregnant with meaning. It's the word in Hebrew, mishpat. M-I-S-H. P-A-T. And there are four elements to God's judgment. Write these down, memorize them. When you see the word judging or judgment in Scripture, think of these four words. Discrimination. These are all in the word for judgment, which is a perfection in God. Uh, discrimination. Vindication, destruction, salvation. You see why I say the words pregnant with meaning? I mean, all of those elements are in that Hebrew word for judgment. Discrimination. God discriminates. He's never neutral. He discriminates. He distinguishes between good and evil and, uh, 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 and hates evil and loves good. Everything in him rises up to discriminate against evil wherever it occurs. Where either the looters are on the streets of our ci uh, cities or the looters that are in the Congress of the United States. He hates all evil. And he discriminates against it. And he discriminates for the good. God loves good. God loves good actions. God loves good people. Of course, he has to make the good first. And so God, first of all, discriminates in judgment. Distinguishes between evil and good. And discriminates against evil and for good. Second word. Vindicates. God is at work in human history vindicating himself and anything that he has established that's being assaulted by depraved man. If the church is under assault, God will vindicate his church. If a godly state is under assault, God will vindicate a godly state. If you, a godly family or a godly person, are under assault, God will vindicate you, and God will vindicate his name, and God will vindicate his covenant. He will not let these things go, uh, people who persecute them, unpunished. Third word, destruction. To vindicate himself, he destroys all his enemies. We see that in our psalm very strongly. He casts his enemies, impenitent enemies, into hell. In time and in eternity. God's not neutral. You rebel against God's moral order. You rebel against his social order. You rebel against his words. God will destroy you. Which destruction leads to fourth, the salvation of God's people. When God's enemies are destroyed, God's people are saved and exalted. And that's how God always saves his people from their enemies, by destroying their enemies. And that what's, that's what makes rapturism such a lie. Rapturism says the way God saves us from our enemies is by rapturing us out from the midst of our enemies. Not taught anywhere in the scriptures, ever. 
Remember how God saved Israel from Egypt. Did God just up and rapture Israel out of Egypt? No. God destroyed Egypt. What do you think the plagues were aimed at? The plagues were aimed at destroying the gods. Every one of the, of the plagues was aimed at some god that the Egyptians worshipped. <clears throat> so the plagues were aimed at destroying the religion and the economy of Egypt. And then God killed all the firstborn of all the families. It doesn't say all the firstborn babies. It says all the firstborn. You could be an adult in the firstborn. And then he drowned the whole Egyptian army. So how did God save Israel from Egypt? By destroying Egypt. God judges his enemies. Destroys them for the sake of his people. To save them. And brothers and sisters, if God has to destroy America to save his church, he will do it. Don't think we're invulnerable. Only a fool would pick a fight with God. So, judgment, uh, discrimination, vindication, destruction, and salvation. You got that? What's the Hebrew word? Mishpat. What's the word for righteousness? Sedek. It means to always act in accordance with the character. To always act in strict conformity to God's own character, which character is revealed in the law and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's look at this great song. By the way, you sang it. That's the first song we sang this morning. We sang song. So it has five stanzas, and they're not all the same length. So let me give you a quick rundown of what the stanzas are about. Stanza one, which is verses one and two, says that God is to be praised because he's revealed himself to us. Second stanza, in verses three through six, God's righteousness is the guarantee of the defeat of our enemies. Verses 7 through 10, God's righteousness is the guarantee of the church's security. Fourth stanza, 11 through 16, God's righteousness is to be the subject of the church's praise. And verses 17 through 20, God's righteousness must be the content of the church's prayers. Anybody want me to repeat those again? I'll be glad to. Just raise your hand. All right. Now let's look at these stanzas. I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart. I will tell of all thy wonders. I will... Be glad and exult in thee. I'll sing praise to thy name, O Most High. So here you have David giving his testimony, saying the most important thing I do in life, the thing I love to do the most in life, the thing that is the loftiest, holiest thing I do in life is to praise God. Not just with cliches, praise God, thank the Lord, but from the heart, you see the word? I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart. That's where the praise originates. God's changed my heart. He's captured it. He's filled it with praise. And that's why I do everything. That's why I live. That's why I work. That's why I fight. That's why I do everything in an attempt to praise and honor God from my heart. But notice it doesn't stay in my heart. I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart. I will tell of all thy wonders. True Christians are singing people. They have a praise to God in their heart, and it is going to show itself through their lips. They're going to want to sing God's praise as a church, at home with their families, in the shower, in the car, 
wherever they can, their lips move. This praise that fills their hearts comes out of their lips and sings. Are you a singing Christian? Does it ever occur to you to sing? What does David praise God for and what does he sing God's praises about? In this psalm, it's not simply the benefits and the blessings he gets from God, but it's something even more profound. He says in verse 2, I will be glad and exult in thee. I will sing praise to thy name, to the revelation of your character and will. O Most High. So this exuberant praise that fills David's heart and that comes through his mouth is a praise that God has revealed himself to him. He knows God. This is not, he's not an idol. He's not a figment of his imagination. That God has brought him into communion and fellowship with himself and in that fellowship, David is allowed to know God. That's what the word name means. The word name is the revelation of God's character and God's will found in Holy Scripture and in Christ. And then in verses 3 through 6, he gets more specific. And he says, God's righteousness, I'm going to praise him for his righteousness and his judgment because they're the guarantee of the defeat of all our enemies. And David had the enemies. Remember what Winston Churchill said? If you don't have any enemies, you're not doing anything. <laughs> there are all kinds of people wanting to kill David, even in his own household. In the early days, the civil government was against him. In the latter part, his own sons were against him. And of course, all around him, you had various other foreign powers that were against him. And God's righteousness, the fact that God never changes his character and acts according to his holy character, was the guarantee that all of his wicked enemies would perish and he would survive. So verse 3 through 6. When my enemies turn back, they stumble and perish before thee. Not before me. I'm a great warrior. I'm a great military man. I'm a great general. I'm one of the greatest generals and warriors of the whole Middle East. But... My enemies turn back and stumble and perish, not because of me, but before thee, O God. You, O God, are the warrior of Israel. Verse 4, for thou hast maintained my just cause. What? Uh, why was his cause just? Because he was standing for God. He was standing with God. He was seeking to apply God's law and maintain God's covenant and defend God's holy nation. For thou hast maintained my just cause. Thou dost sit on the throne judging righteously. Sitting on a throne is a metaphor for sovereignty. Twice in this psalm, God's sovereignty is brought up. My enemies are scattered. They perish before thee. You maintain my cause because you're the sovereign God of the universe. You have everything under control. And when you judge men, you judge them according to your holy character. You discriminate between these evil enemies and these faithful people. And you destroy the enemies for the salvation of your people. And in the meanwhile, your name is vindicated. Thou hast rebuked the nations. Now, you're going to see a lot of past tense verbs here. But let me tell you how the Old Testament prophets prophesy the future. They would prophesy the future with past tense verbs so that you're really supposed to translate them as if they were future tense. But the reason they do it in past tense is to let you know, since this is what God has planned, it is as certain that these things are going to take place as if they'd already taken place. So let's make these future. Verse 5. Thou will rebuke the nations. Thou wilt destroy the wicked. You will blot out their name forever and ever. The enemy will come to an end in perpetual ruins. And you will uproot the cities. 
and the very memory of them will perish. That's how total God's destruction of his enemies, the enemies of his church, uh, is throughout history. Total. They declare total warfare on the church. God declares total warfare on them. And he's going to blot out his enemies to the point that they're going to be in perpetual ruins and their memory will even perish from the history books. Do you know how many enemies of God's people for the past 4,000 years nobody knows about anymore? God's people have had enemies since they came into existence and most of those enemies are their names blotted out and these guys that we think are so important today you think 200 years anybody's going to know Joe Biden? Unless they study American history. Even then they might not. Think anybody's going to know the name Barack Obama? Oh, they may know he was America's first black president. That's all they know. Donald Trump, unless he submits completely to the supremacy of God, they'll know here's this rich guy, not like the press. God blots out their memory of his enemies who dare to attack his church. And then in the next uh, third stanza, we see that God's righteousness is the guarantee of the church's security. We conclude, conclude that because God's justice and God's righteousness are the guarantee of the destruction of our enemies, which means that our salvation is sure. Verse 7, But the Lord, it says in Hebrew, sits as king. Remember, that's what it said in verse 4. Now to sit on throne. Kings sit on thrones. Here David is finding solace and comfort and encouragement in knowing that God is sovereign. He has established his throne, his sovereignty for judgment and he will judge the world in righteousness. Here this sovereign God who foreordains everything that's come to pass comes to pass that has everything under his control holds the reign of the universe how in the world can his judgment and his righteousness fail? When God goes to judge his enemies for the sake of the church, you think God's going to fail? You think anybody's going to get away with anything? A sovereign God. And when this God of judgment and God of righteousness is sovereign, you never question his actions. You never complain. You never criticize. You don't say to him, Lord, these tragedies that are happening in my life, I deserve better than this. No, you don't say that. You don't say, God, how can you be just in the way you treat me and let what's going on in this world today? The judge Shall not the judge of all the world do right? In Romans 9, Paul was preaching on predestination. He anticipated people's questions. And when he said he, God loved hate, uh, Jacob and hated Esau, he anticipated the question, well, uh, is God unjust then? And then Paul answers with two Greek words. Meganoito. Absolutely not. Well, if God's sovereign like you said, Paul, uh, how can uh, we expect justice from him? And Paul says, Shall not the God of all the world do right? Who are you, O oh man, that you would answer back to God? Does not the potter do with the clay whatever he will? Discussion closed. You never question the justice, the righteousness, or the judgment of a sovereign God. 
verse 8, he'll judge the world. Nobody in all of human history in all the world is going to get away with its defiant rebellion against God if they don't repent. <coughs> he will execute judgment on the peoples with equity. The Lord also will be a stronghold for the oppressed, his oppressed. A stronghold in times of trouble. That's where we find shelter. That's where we find protection and encouragement. In a sovereign God who is righteous and who judges according to his righteousness. 10. And those who know thy name, those who know God personally and who to whom God has revealed himself, will put their trust in thee. And in times like this, impeachments, coronavirus, riots, they forgot the murdering hornet, however, somehow that <laughs> through the cracks. There'll be something else. But we know thy name. We put our trust in thee, and you know that in the midst of this, O oh God, you will not forsake those that seek. Fourth stanza. God's righteousness is to be the subject of the church's praise. Sing praises to the Lord who dwells in Zion, that is, in the church. Declare among the peoples his deeds. Don't even declare God's wonders to the people in church and singing the hymns, but declare the truth about God who dwells in the church to the people's worlds, to the, to the world's peoples. We're talking about evangelism here. David saying, tell the Canaanites and the Philistines, and all the rest, that the God of the creation dwells in Zion and declare to the peoples of this world his mighty deeds. For he who requires blood remembers them. He does not forget the cry of the afflicted. Man. What a phrase. God's going to remember his people that are being mocked and ridiculed, marginalized, killed, Nigeria, by the enemies of God. God here will hear their cries of all in, in the midst of all their afflictions. And God will answer them. Why? Because he who requires blood remembers them. The only God there is requires the blood of his persistent enemies. God's enemies will perish. God will destroy them. He will shed their blood because God requires blood. destruction, death of those who oppose him, his moral order, his social order, his church, his day, his covenant bond. And if you've sinned, anybody in here sinned? If you've sinned, God requires your blood or the blood of a substitute. God would take your blood and send you to hell with all of his enemies if there had not been a substitute provided by God himself to shed his blood in our place, to take the punishment our sins deserve, so that without the shedding of blood of Jesus, there is no forgiveness of sin. And you notice in all these discussions going on, there's no forgiveness. Nobody's willing to forgive anybody. Because there is no forgiveness of sin outside of Jesus Christ. There is no forgiveness. You can shut your eyes and act like things didn't exist. You can hope things didn't exist. But there is no forgiveness of sin and cleansing of sin. 
outside the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, if you sin, God will require your blood or the blood of a substitute. So let me encourage you to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your only hope of salvation. Verse 13. Be gracious to me, O God. Be gracious? How do we get to gracious? I thought we were talking about justice, judgment, and, and righteousness. And now all of a sudden, he's saying, God's a God of grace. Doesn't he know he's contradicting himself? I mean, how in the world can a God of justice and judgment, who discriminates against evil, vindicates his name, destroys his enemies. How in the world do we get from there to grace and God's mercy and God's unmerited favor? Here's how. The cross. The cross of Jesus is the display of God's righteousness, God's judgment, and God's grace. It has been said that on the cross, mercy and justice kiss each other. How's that? Well, God is merciful in providing with the substitute because he didn't have to. He could have just let the whole human race go into hell and get what it deserved and not saved anybody. But in his wondrous mercy and grace and kindness, he displayed that love by sending Jesus into the world for die, to die for us. And even though God did not have to have mercy on us at all, having decided to be merciful to us, the only way left open to him to show that mercy was in the death of his son. And in that son's death, God's justice was satisfied. God's justice had claims against you because you were a sinner and you deserved to die. Jesus silenced those claims by taking the very judgment that you deserve. That's how we get to grace. Be gracious to me, O Lord. Protect me and bless me. I don't deserve it. And I thank you for the display of your grace and your mercy in sending sovereignly your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to satisfy the claims of your law and the claims of your justice against me. Verse 13, be gracious to me, O Lord. Behold my affliction from those who hate me. Just look what you're doing to me. Thou who just lift me up from the gates of death, saving me from my enemies, lift, up, lift them me up, that I may tell of thy praises. God, deliver me from my enemies, not so I'll be more comfortable, not so I'll be happier, so that I can tell to the world and praise to the world what a great God of righteousness and grace you are. That in the gates of the daughter of Zion <coughs> I may rejoice in thy salvation. The nations in rebellion against God will sink down in the pit which they have made. In the net which they hid their own foot has been caught. Boy, have we seen that this week. I thought of that verse when I was watching a video of two young white men throwing bricks at a store. Now that God calls them to shoot their arrows into their own breasts and fall down into the pits they've made. So these two young men were walking in front of the store. Each one of them had a brick. One son hurled his brick through the window and the other young man decided he was going to hurl his. But the first young man made a mistake of walking in front of the second guy. And so when the second guy hurled his brick, his friend was about that far from him, and he hit his head, and the last we saw was the man collapsed on the ground. God causes them to fall in their own pit. That's why you don't need to worry. Nations have sunk down in the pit which they have made, in the net which they hid. 
their own foot has been caught, the Lord has made himself known. He has executed judgment. In the work of his own hands, the wicked is snared. God revealed himself and how great he was in discriminating between his evil enemies and his faithful friends, in vindicating his name in behalf of his friends, in destroying his enemies, and in saving and exalting his friends. God made himself known. Pray that. Don't pray any little mealy mouth prayer. Lord, help us to love each other. Think you might as well listen to that? The time has come now to be big boys and big girls. And pray, Almighty God, display your justice and your judgment and your grace. Now, notice those two Hebrew words that I quoted there at the end of verse 16. Higion, Selah. Well, when you're reading the psalm, you're not supposed to say those words because those words are addressed to the choir director. And the word Selah means, let the people think about this. This is quite a thought. So at this point, Beat the drums, blow the trumpet, crash the cymbals. Selah. Impress upon the singers how important this thought is. The Lord has made himself known. He's executed judgment in the work of his own hands. The wicked is snared. And Higaon means, and do it louder than you normally do. Higaon Selah. Beat the drums louder, blow the trumpets louder, clash the cymbals louder. Because this is quite a thought. Last stanza. God's righteousness and judgment must be the content of the church's prayers. The wicked will be returned to hell. Even all the nations who forget God. So, America continues on her path of forgetting God. Forgetting God, she'll be turned into hell. For the needy, that is, his needy, would all always be forgotten. Even though the world has forgotten about the Nigerian Christians who are being butchered every day. God has not forgotten them. And he will turn their persecutors into hell. For the needy will not always be forgotten, nor the hope of the afflicted perish forever. And here's the prayer you need to memorize and pray every day. Arise, O Lord! Get up off your throne and come as a warrior to display your justice and judgment and righteousness and grace. Arise, O Lord, stand up, take your sword to your thigh. Lay down your scepter and take your sword and march out into the field and lead your people. Don't let man prevail. Let the nations that are in rebellion against you be judged before you. Put these enemies of yours in fear of you, O Lord. And let all the nations know that they are but men. Blow the trumpet. <clears throat> Beat the drum. Crash the cymbals. Has God ever taught you that you're but a man? Oh, it hurts. It hurts. It's one of the best things that ever happened to you. We ought to do something in your life and teach you you're not God. You're just a man. That's the prayer we pray. Instead of praying, Lord, I have this uh, hangnail. It hurts. Would you help my hangnail? Lord, I have the sniffles. Would you help me clear up my sniffles because I just feel so bad. Lord, uh, I'm lonely Saturday. I need a date. Would you give me a date, please, so that I couldn't be lonely? So we pray. Our prayers are so emasculated 
and self-centered. And God says our prayers must be for his justice. And when God tells you to pray for something, he intends to bring about what he told you to pray for as you pray for it. So make this a constant prayer during all this problems and more. Arise, O Lord, do not let man prevail. Whether the man is throwing Molotov cocktails in the streets, whether he's judging on the Supreme Court, whether he's legislating in the Congress, don't let evil man prevail. Let the nations of the world and even this country be judged before thee. Put them in fear of you, O Lord. May they fear you above all else. And let the nations know that they are but men. Let us pray.